This video is on how to uh, assemble the five main components of the chimney, which are comprised of the outside body with the base, the grill, the 6mm top, uh, and there's an angular step where the ash pan goes. So those five uh, pieces of the main components, they need to be tacked together, nice and square, fully welded, uh, before anything else is done. The next stage is to put the uh, transition on the top of it and that will be included in this video as well. The very first thing I need to say is that the, the front face of the chimney needs to be absolutely flush if you want to get any form of uh, quality into this project so that's what you're going to focus on at the start. So we start off by getting the base plate uh, and the main body and we want to fit the base plate into the main body with the main body lying on its back on a flat steel table. Clamp it together around the top, making sure these two edges are flush all the way around the two sides and the back. Uh, get as many clamps as you need to and make sure you use standard vice grips because they've got serrated jaws. Don't use the C-clamps and especially don't use the C-clamps with uh, the swivel flat feet on them because they slip very, very easily. In order to get the uh, front face as flat as possible, you also need to uh, line the, the base plate up with the front edges of the main body and I've stuck a rule from one side to the other and we want this uh, to be absolutely flush right across this face at the same time as it's flush around the three sides where we're going to tack weld it. So the two vertical edges on the main body uh, need to be absolutely square and I've uh, put a square on these two. If you find that they aren't square you actually need to go along the edge of it with a hammer and just dress it in very gently while it's light, while the side of the main body is lying flat on the table to give it a wee bit of stability. So just tap along the edges very gently until they're square. Once it's put together properly, you shouldn't actually have this gap along this uh, across the front face from one side to the other. As I say, it needs to be absolutely flush. So with the base leveled up with the two sides in the back, I've stitch welded it uh, in here with the TIG torch. I didn't use the MIG because I didn't want large lumpy welds slumping over the edges. And you can see I've just done 25mm welds. Just uh, four or five across each face is sufficient to hold it in place. With the chim sitting on its bottom, on the inside, you can just mark it with a permanent marker. Some 25mm stitch welds just around the inside, and they're going to be MIG welded in. They only need to be stitched every so often to give it a bit of strength. You've already stitched it with the TIG on the outside. On the very front face, just put two little uh, tacks of TIG. You don't want to be welding these up at the moment, otherwise it'll start to uh, pull the face in. So just two tacks and leave it at that. At this point, get in here with a repurposed file and scrape the spatter off the surface. More difficult pieces can be taken off with a hammer and chisel. Uh, it's not, they're not going to be seen because the angular spacer uh, for the ash pan goes over the top of these welds, but that's not the point. You should always clean your welds up nice and neat. It's just a good habit to get into. The next item we fit is the angular spacer that goes in, creates the cavity for the ash pan. With putting the uh, shelf in, you need to put it in at the back and then push the two sides into place. Once you've done that, you might find that there's a gap on the inside, or you will find that there's a gap on the inside. The very front face, we've decided that you should actually trim it down to get it to fit the correct width. So what we did is we made the very front edge slightly wider. This being a fitting exercise, you need to learn how to fit things together. So that the gap on the inside will need to be trimmed off the vertical face to actually get the side arm to fit hard against the side panel. You can also see that we've uh, I've chamfered the corner. You've got a square edge going into a slight radius which pushes it out. If you put a sort of a uh, chamfer on there, it doesn't matter what angle it needs to be. It could be 45 degrees. And trim your front face down so that you've got a slight gap because you want um, penetration to go down that front face when you weld it. So you want to leave a gap down there of about one and a half millimetres to get a good bit of penetration when you do actually weld it. The front face needs to be flush right across the front again. Put a 600 millimetre rule from one side to the other and make sure that the shelf that you're putting in actually pulls up to the two side panels to make it flush across the front face. Once again, that whole front face needs to be absolutely flush to produce a quality job. When you put it in, if there's a slight gap at the back, it doesn't matter. 
grate goes on top of this and it gets covered up so you won't see it. The second point is uh, if it does push forward past the 600 millimeter rule that you've got across the front face you will need to trim a slice off the back edge so that you can push the whole angular shelf further back inside the chimney to get that uh, front face flush. So you've cut everything to size, you've got it, uh, got the shelf in there, you can see that I've got two clamps on the front face, both at the very top. The critical issue is that when you put this, put the shelf in here to tack weld it, that you want that vertical edge that you've trimmed down to be parallel from the top to the bottom, leaving a gap of about one and a half millimetres. With it clamped at the top, you can stick a screwdriver in at the bottom, just to, you can drive that screwdriver in as hard as you need to, just to get it to stand, that edge to stand vertical or parallel uh, between it and the side. You don't want it on an angle at all. You can see I've put a tack right at the very top and a tack right at the very bottom on the inside. You don't want that tack on the inside to be too big because the drawer has to slide in and out and it's quite a tight fit. So you don't want to be putting a weld. In fact, there's supposed to be no welds down the sides on the inside. Here's the back panel. You can see that I've put three pen marks on it, 25 millimeter long welds. The tray, when it goes in, stops 15 millimeters short from the back. So you'll have three welds at the front and the two tacks on the front and that's all you're going to do to weld it in. That 15 millimeter gap allows the tray to go right in without actually hitting the welds and because you've got no welds down the sides on the bottom, the tray won't catch on it and that's all the welding that you're going to do on it. If you find when you put the angle in that you can't get it to sit hard down on the corner, you can stand a piece of timber up the back of the back panel of the chum and put a C-clamp on it with flat feet. When you smack the end of the timber, it will drive the base down. You can also do this for the grate when it goes in. You can push it down, and because the clamp is on it, it won't spring back up. So hit the timber with a decent hammer. It'll push it down. The clamp will stop it from coming back up. That'll hold it in position. Okay, so having fitted the angular spacer in, that we now need to fit the grate. It's got to be flush across the front face yet again. So you're going to put a 600 millimeter or a meter rule across the front face and pull it forward. You can put a couple of duckbill vice grips, the wide jawed vice grips on it to hold it in place. And then on the inside of it we're going to have the same welding pattern that we had for the very base when we welded the base into the side. So we're going to have stitch welds around the outside, uh, 25 millimeter welds evenly spaced in the corners, one in the middle and then one in the middle of that again. One of the things that we need to consider when we put the uh, grate inside the chimney is you can get a gap down the sides. Now in this photo that I've got on the screen at the moment the roll slips down the back corner so there's a gap there of about 1.6 millimeters. We want to pinch those two faces up nice and tight uh, with tacks using the hammer and the dolly. So the dolly is in the center of the screen there. So I've tapped it. I use the hammer on the inside with the dolly exactly on the outside and I just tap the tack weld hard closed and it will close the gap up to nothing. This photo you can see that there's no gap down there now and it's only then that I would actually do my welds on it. So we need to sandwich the two surfaces together before we start to weld them. So get your stitch welds in there and then you need to clean it up with a repurpose file to get rid of all the spatter off the weld. Might even be able to get in there with the orbital sander and clean the surface up as well. Just give it a good tidy up. From this point we are working towards putting the 6mm top on. I've got a square sitting here off the front edge of the grate and I want the two outside edges to be standing absolutely vertical with the square or there's no gap down the sides of them. You can see in the bottom left hand corner there's a gap here which means the side is pulling in at the top and in this photo there's a slight gap at the top which means the top is leaning out compared with the base. We need to get those two sides parallel or vertical before we start putting the 6mm top on. This is the reason we actually haven't done any welding other than tacking it together. We need to get the 6mm top on and tacked in place fully before we start welding it into place and all of the front face. It's got to be held together before we fully start welding it. So we're now we're at the stage of fitting the 6mm top. The top needs to be absolutely flush once again up the front of the chimney. You can see in the photo with the roll that I put up the face that is what we're aiming for. There will be two points where the top could actually bind up and push forward out past the front edge. That is in this photo here. The radius that I've put on the top actually fits into the radius of the steel 
and the very back face where the plate hits up to it can bind up in that point and you may need to push the whole plate back a bit which means you'll have to take more out of this point and the front point to get it to sit flush on the front face. So having got it flush on the front face I've put one tack on the front corner and the plate needs to sit flat along the top edge of where it's going to be welded and it's going to have a tack right on the very top. So there'll be a tack at each end and then I will start to stitch weld in underneath the 6mm plate to the 3mm side. You can see in my video that my plate had a slight uh, curve in it and I've uh, decided to go with the plate instead of throwing it out. Probably not the best idea but uh, that's why it looks like that with a slight curve in under there. So I back step welded it across here. You can see that I've started, uh, done the first weld, number one, about 75 mil long. Then I've started uh, the start point. So wherever the weld is, I go in the direction that I'm going back to the previous weld. That's what back step welding is. So I've done the uh, main length of the run, and then I've stood the chimney on its front face and welded across the top and across the bottom just to finish the welding off. Chip all your spatter off from that point, tidy up any lumps if you have to with the sander but uh, you don't want to go any further than that. So at this point we have uh, assembled all the components. We've got the top tacked to the body, we've got the basin, the grate in and the angular step that uh, creates the cavity for the ash pan. So now you can fully weld it up. The crucial thing is that you want a gap between two surfaces to allow penetration to get down into the joint. If you've got no gap, you need to drop the cutoff disc into the line where the welder is going to be. The cutoff discs being one millimetres wide will create a space for the weld to penetrate down in. This is really important, otherwise when you sand all your weld off, if you haven't got any penetration, your welds are actually going to crack. So it's crucial that you get some penetration in any welds that you're actually doing. This clip here shows a hole uh, between the grate, the side and the ash pan spacer. You can fill that in with the MIG torch. Everything else can be welded with the MIG torch. It's quite a big hole and uh, it'll just take a too much time with the TIG torch, so fill it in with a MIG. Um, you might have to operate on off with the torch because you don't want to blow a hole, you just want to fill it up. So you might have to uh, stop start the weld a few times, do a bit of weld, cool it down, do a bit more weld so that you actually fill it up. The settings that I use for doing the MIG welding are on the screen now on the EWM welders. So that's for the MIG torch. The All the other welds that are TIG welded, you need a bit of heat. So the weld settings are on the screen for the BOP 285 uh, amp welders. So you can just copy those and do your TIG welding with that. You'll probably need to use about a 1.6 millimeter wire for all your welds because you need a bit of filler material. So use that as well. Having completed uh, welding all of the uh, five components together of the chimney, you can now put the transition on. In this photo it actually shows it with a spigot on the top. You don't want the spigot on it because you may actually have to put a couple of big C-clamps in through that face or that end to actually clamp the two pieces together so that can be welded on last. Across here we've got the 3mm transition hitting the 6mm mild steel top. You need to have a 3mm gap across here so that you can have a fillet weld. That means that the two pieces of material will be flush on the inside and there will be a 3mm step. The transition will be 3mm lower at this point than the 6mm steel. That fillet will actually fill that in. It gives you a little shelf to do a nice little weld across there. When you start to join this together, you need to start in the very centre and move out either side evenly. Uh, and you want to stop about 70 millimetres from each end because you need to line the back up and do exactly the same thing with the back, working from the centre out to within 70 millimetres of each end. And then at that point, you can weld or tack together across the very ends of the transition to the body. You will have some difficulty in aligning the very outside edges up. Sometimes we have to get a cold chisel in there with a hammer or a hammer and dolly just to pull the two surfaces even before we actually put tacks on them. You really need to ask 
a tutor to show you what to do at this point because it's a bit fiddly and a bit complicated and you need some clear instruction. In this view you can see I've got quite a gap. Gap at this point is probably about two millimeters right on the outside edge. I will pull that in by heat shrinking my tacks that I've done previously. Once again this is a bit complicated for a person that's learning so you need to ask some questions at this point and you'll be shown what to do. Welding across the end it's a bit gappy so you need to run it with uh, lowish amps. You want to overfill the joint with material because when you sand it off you want plenty of material there to leave a sharp edge. Across the back panel the amps are uh, at 90 and you just need to weld across there slowly so that you could get good penetration. In this video you can see me using the half round dolly by putting it on the inside of the chimney and using a cross pane hammer to level the welds up. I should say that the welds need to be about uh, 30 millimeters apart maximum. You can see that I've got a bigger gap on my welds at this end. It shouldn't. It should actually be a lot closer together because the closer they are when you start welding it won't distort as much. I'm just levelling the tacks up. It's quite fiddly getting your hand in the end of the chimney here and as you can see I've already put the spigot on because I knew what I, I could get away with but I told you students not to put the spigot on until last so I'd sooner you did that please. At this point I'm uh, cleaning up the end weld. I've got a grinder with a grinding disc on it. I've overfilled the weld so that it's actually sitting up above the surface so when I grind it and sand it and orbital sand it I've got material to take off. I don't want any hollows in it where I would have to go back and fill it in. So grinding the excess bulk off the weld just at the start You will of course make sure that you are wearing your full face shield and your safety glasses. Unplugging the grinder there and changing over to a sander. So I've got a 120 grit sanding disc on this. You don't want an aggressive disc. We've got only one, we've only got 36s and 120, so you only want to use the 120 sanding disc. And you can see that I'm trying to keep the sander once again absolutely flat onto the surface. You don't want the sander standing up on its toe and putting gouge marks on the surface. Get it as flat as possible to the surface that you're working on. Just softening the edges probably got some sharp uh, edges on it from the guillotine just tidying those up I've changed over to a brand new disc just to finish it off the previous disc had started to glaze up and wasn't cutting properly it just creates more friction than anything else from this point I'm using the orbital sander you don't need a full full, mace, uh, full face shield on for the orbital sander it's very slow action so I've sanded it up finishing it off with the orbital sander radiusing the edges with the orbital sander, just rolling the sand around the corners just to soften it all. Grinding up the front face using a grinder with a cutting disc. You can see that I've got the grinder at quite a steep angle so that the outside, very outside edge of the grinding disc is taking the top off the weld. You need to be very careful that you only take the top off the weld and don't lower it down too much so that it actually starts the cutting into the sheet. You just want to be removing the weld only. Just going to let the video run. You can watch as much as you want and then we will start with the sanding.
Now that you've got the surface ground down, leaving 0.5 of a millimetre of uh, weld material left on there, you're going to use the sander. Sander needs to be kept as flat as possible onto the surface, even if you're dragging the guard. You need to cut from multiple angles. I've shown in other videos, don't just keep cutting one way. If you cut from multiple angles, it takes the it makes the surface flatter and it takes an undulation out of the surface that you can get if you just cut one way. So move all around, cutting continuously from different angles. Sand as flat as possible until you get the surfaces flush. Be very careful you don't grind them too, in one spot too long. Put the rule across the surface of it to make sure that you're not putting a hollow or a depression where you're grinding. If you keep moving around you should actually eliminate that, but just be very focused of what you're trying to do. Trying to get a flat surface, not a surface that's got a hollow in it because you've worked too hard in one area with the sand. Once again, the video can run. Having sanded it all, you can now use the orbital sander on it. Using the orbital sander, it's just going to take out all the grinding marks, the sanding marks, and smooth the surface. Run the orbital sander over the edges, just to soften everything. Take all the sharp edges off that might be left from the guillotine, or sharp edges that could be left from the sander itself. So trying to get a very uniform surface that's got no deep gouges or sanding marks in the surface. Do that on both ends. You're not doing any sanding on the front face or any sanding grinding on the back face. Just do the two ends only and leave it at that. In the interest of making a professional looking job, I square cut all the top corners in the opening, which is the firebox, just using a flat um, second cut file. You might find some files that have a flat edge, uh, sorry, no teeth on one of the narrow edges which allows you to cut one way without actually accidentally grinding into the face 90 degrees to it. If there's not, just get a standard um, second cut file, just take your time, square cut the corners, just makes your job look so much better, so much more professional instead of having big holes in the corners. Uh, if, if you have got a hole, maybe you need to drop some weld into it so that when you do file it, you actually end up with a square corner. Uh, so just, just overfill the hole if you need to, and then go back and square cut it. The very last thing we have to do is to tidy the corners up for the ash pan cavity. It's a bit lumpy where we use the MIG welder at the top to uh, fill the hole in. So what I've got here is the 10mm power sander or linisher, small linisher, and I'm just cutting the bulk of those welds off. Once I've cut the bulk of the weld off, I'm going to get in here with a file. We want to put a nice 45 degree angle right in each corner. So the four corners will have a little mark of 45 degrees, which we use a file to create. And as we cut it with the file, we radius uh, the file in around the corner. So I'm just cutting it square for a start. It takes a wee bit of time, but once again, if you want to produce a quality job, you can do these corners, it might take you half an hour to do them, just to make it look top notch.
So this concludes the video on how to assemble the chimney main body, putting the transition on the top of it, the sequence that you need to assemble it in, tack it together, weld it, how to grind it, how to sand it, use the orbital sander on it to clean it up, and how to square cut the corners to make it look sharp and professional looking.